um, the fact that there is this book that exists and is sold to the world as high art. And at the sake of degrading that art, we let down a 12 year old girl who was serial raped throughout the course of this text. And I think about that book a lot, and I think about the ways that it's circulated in English classrooms. I think about the ways that it's circulated to young women and the messages we give to young women with those books about the ways that they're valued and the ways that they are and aren't going to be valued in this world. Um, so I really wanted to have a text which is survivor-centered and centers that young girl who lost a lot of things, but I also wanted a text which didn't just define her by her trauma. And I think um, author of Reading Lolita in Tehran, Azar Nafisi, says it best when she says, Lolita belongs to a category of victims who have no defense and are never given a chance to articulate their own story. As such, she becomes a double victim. Not only her life, but also her life story is taken from her. So I'm going to just read the first section of my novel, and in it, you're going to kind of see this fluctuation between the 12-year-old who's having these experiences and the 17-year-old who died at the end of that original novel. Um, so you may there may be times when the voice is a little bit unclear, or we kind of move to this like bird's eye view moment, but I promise you that um, if you just bear with me, I think it'll make sense in the long term. If not, let me know so that I can correct myself. <laughs> um, okay, great, so we're just gonna start with my story. My name is Dolores Hayes. Dolores is the name my mother gave me. Lolita was never my name. Lolita was a title, a fantasy, a lie designed to turn me from a child to a seductress. To call me Lolita is to value my rapist story over mine, and yet that is what the world has decided to do. I'm looking at you now and I'm asking you for better. I'm asking you to care about the truth of my story. I wasn't a seductress. A 12 year old girl cannot be a seductress. I was a girl named Dolores. I loved dogs and roller skating and tennis and comic books. I loved my friends and I loved my mother despite all the pain she caused me. I wanted to be a baton twirler at a big university, study drama, and move to New York City where I would act in off Broadway plays and have a window box full of purple flowers. I didn't get to do any of these things. Because when I was 12, a man named Humbert Humbert decided that his fantasies were more important than my life. He killed my mother, and for two years, he did everything in his power to kill me too. But I refused to die under his abuse. I am still refusing to die. I am pushing back on the tombstone the world is trying to push upon me. My story is not a love story. I don't want men to repeat the words, light of my life, fire of my loins, into the ears of young women anymore, into the ears of children. I don't want my story to be a tool for abusers. I want to tell you the truth. That is it. That is my story. And I also want to say that this book, as it's being moved through the world, still has a blurb from Vanity Fair. It's put on the cover of almost every single copy of this book, and the blurb says, the only convincing love story of our century. <laughs> no, I feel a um, okay, chapter one. The summer after I finished seventh grade, I was determined to stay at home. Cases of abdominal flu had broken up sorry, broken out all over town, and I managed to convince my mother that the germs I would encounter at camp would be far worse than anything in Ramsdale. She thought about sending me back to Mrs. Fallon's place, but Mrs. Fallon said she couldn't take me or move in with us on account of her broken hip. Not knowing where else she could send me, my mother decided to let me have the summer to sleep in, read my comic books, play tennis, and swim in Glass Lake with Rose. I was relieved. I didn't want to leave her alone. When we moved from Pisky to Ramsdale two years earlier, I thought I would be starting a new chapter in life where my father and brother had never been. I thought that meant their ghosts wouldn't be able to follow us. At first, uh, it looked like I might be right. Over those first few months, I felt the ice between my father and brother's death start to melt between us. It seemed like my mother was finally figuring out how to be around me without it hurting so much. She started drinking less, taking more of an active interest in, and taking more of an active interest in my life. I'd bike home from school to find her in the kitchen with Louise or maybe reading in the living room. She'd ask me how my day was and what I wanted to eat for dinner. When I waited, went away to camp for the first time, she wrote me letters. I came back to a homemade chocolate cake and a new tennis racket because she said she saw how much I liked playing. Some of you may not understand the full significance of this, but to a child who grows up without these small acts of love, they're everything. The morning before the first day of seventh grade, I woke up to find my mother in, my kitchen, in the kitchen making pancakes. She, she said she'd give Louise the day off so we could have a special mother-daughter day all to ourselves. We never had a mother-daughter day before. I wondered if she was sick, but she wasn't, at least not in the way that I thought she was. We ate pancakes and she told me to go through the cabinets to find every basin cup we had. Why do we need all these cups? I asked, taking the last one down from the cupboard. 
because I want you to start this year in a house full of flowers, today we are going to collect them. And we did. We spent the entire day driving and stopping to gather from random patches of wildflowers and eating uh, sorry, cream cheese cucumber sandwiches. While my mother told me that she might, sorry, <laughs> while we ate, my mother told me she might be taking secretarial classes. She said she needed more of a purpose now. I told her that that sounded like a good idea. By the end of the day, the backseat of our sedan was covered in Queen Anne's lace, lilies, and black eyed Susans, more than enough to fill every makeshift base in our house. We didn't care, we just kept collecting. I think that was the last time I was ever happy in that car. Over the course of the following months, I felt things were finally going to get better, but something changed that October. My mother started backsliding into herself again. The flowers were replaced with the assortment of Mex Mexican trinkets my father had bought my mother on their honeymoon. Sometimes at night, I wondered if they might be cursed. I'm pretty sure my father hadn't particularly cared about what they were or what cultural significance they might hold. All I really know about them was when they came out of their attic box, my mother went quiet. Once again, our evenings together became measured in the amount of scotch she drank. She started snapping at me and going to bed earlier only to get up later. It got to the point where I would only see her intense afternoon passings. I tried to tell myself things hadn't actually gotten worse. They were just returning to the way that they were back in Fisky. And at least this time I had Louise looking out for me, washing my clothes and making sure I ate. She was there to mother me in some of the many ways that my mother couldn't. It wasn't as though Louise loved me. I don't think that I ever really expected her to. She had her own kids and her own community to care about. She didn't have the energy to pour into a lonely white girl with an unkind mother. I don't blame her. We made it through the winter and most of the spring without any major incidents, only our old quiet cracking. My grades began to slip again. I was never close to completely failing, but it became obvious to my teachers that I had little interest in school, and at some point they decided, if I didn't care about my education, then neither did they. It could be so easy to label a child a problem. The worse I started to feel in school, the more I became obsessed with all things Hollywood. I spent hours in front of my bedroom mirror trying to copy the expressions of the starlets and actresses in my coveted magazines. I bought tubes of red lipstick, hoping they would make me look like a teenager. 18 became the magic number. All I had to do was make it to 18, get discovered, and then the world would be mine. I had no idea that I would never get to be 18. Things continued on like this until the first warm, sorry, the first warm April night of 1947. I had spent the evening at Rose's house gossiping and help her, helping her cut out magazine photos out for her many collages. It was 10 o'clock by the time I turned onto my street and noticed my living room lights were still on. This in itself was strange. My mother should have been asleep by now, or at least pretending to be asleep. Maybe she had forgotten to turn the lights off. That wasn't like her. When I walked in, I found her standing in the living room. She was wearing an unfamiliar yellow sundress, clutching a bottle of gin and swaying to music only she could hear. I could tell. She tried to get herself dressed when she was already drunk. Her bun was coming out and her smeared attempt at lipstick had turned her mouth into an ugly red wound. Mama, her eyes lit up when she saw me. Dolly, my beautiful girl, Harold and I were just talking about you. The night we made you. You know, I was wearing this very same dress. He didn't even bother to take it off. Said he just couldn't wait. He had to have me. She took a long swig from her gin bottle and spun around. Ah, I love this song. Come dance with us, Lo. Shh, we can't be too loud. We don't want to wake the baby. What baby, Mama? I knew what baby. What baby? What baby, she asked. Can you believe this? Your brother, silly girl. You're just as dense as your father sometimes. Or, or is something else going on? Have, have you been drinking? No, Mama, I haven't been drinking. Good. Girls like you shouldn't be out this late drinking. Boys like to take advantage. Your father says sometimes it just makes things easier. Isn't that right, honey? This version of my mother was somehow worse than the years of closed doors and silences that had dominated my childhood. I wanted her to snap out of it and tell me and stop telling me nasty things about my father that I didn't want to hear. Stop it! Daddy's dead. My brother's dead. It's just you and me now, remember? A pause hung between us as the truth of my words pushed her back to the surface of reality. Her smile slipped away and the beginnings of tears glimmered at the corner of her eyes. You always ruin everything. I don't try to. Well, you do. It's just your nature. It's God's way of punishing me. Maybe you're not the only one who's being punished here, Mama. Go to bed, Dolores. Fine. The tears didn't come until I was up in my room, cocooned in the soothing darkness of my duvet. They weren't sad tears. They were hot and angry. I wanted to go downstairs and yell at my mother till she heard the way I heard. I wanted to tell her that she was a pathetic alcoholic shell of a mother, that she was a weak and ugly woman who couldn't figure out how to move on with her life without my bully of a father. I sobbed into my pillow and tried to convince myself it was all true. I tried to convince myself that I hated her and that if she didn't love me, that was her fault, not mine. 
But once I was too tired to cry anymore, I realized I didn't believe any of those things. I could never hate her or fully free myself from the blame of her misery. I, was good, I wasn't good in the way other children were good. My existence was ruining any chance she might have at a new life. But somehow I also understood right then that I was the one keeping her alive. How much more would she have drunk if I hadn't come home? How much would she drink if I left? If she were alone in this house at night all by herself? Even if she had stopped loving me, she still understood that she was responsible for me. And that responsibility was the only thing keeping her from going under completely. I fell asleep at night knowing that no matter what, I couldn't leave her that summer. Okay, now we're gonna enter bird's eye view mode. <clears throat> A brief note from Dolores. Since we are often not given the language and Sorry, since we are often not given the language and safety to come forward with our stories, statistics about childhood sexual abuse are sometimes the most are the most difficult statistics to gather. Any child can become a victim of this abuse, and it's critical we think about who is vulnerable, who is believed, and who is systematically unsupported. There's a reason disabled children, poor children, black children, undocumented children, and native children are most at risk. Predators pick victims because they see people they can take advantage of. Humbert Humbert picked me because he saw a lonely girl who didn't have any adults in her life she could trust. From where I'm sitting, all I can say is where there's smoke, there's fire. All right, we're coming back down to earth. Um, though my mother and I never talked about that night, things in our house did start to change. She became invisible again. Her previously empty days were filled with lunches with Mrs. Hamilton, church functions, and even school events. We still lived our lives mostly apart in the same house, but she was no longer a shadow hidden away in her bedroom. At first, I wondered if she'd realized that she'd hit pop, sorry, rock bottom, and this was her way of trying to recover, maybe even recover for my sake. It wasn't until a few weeks later when I caught her practicing her lipstick smile in front of her bathroom mirror that I understood what was actually happening. She wasn't trying to bond with the other mo mothers of Ramsdale to be better for me. She had befriended them to, cat to catalog and to copy. She needed to figure out how to be like those women in order to get what she now wanted, a new man. Despite the fact that my father had been dead for almost my entire life, his presence had always been big enough in our lives that I hadn't considered the possibility of my mother ever getting married again. The idea filled me with new hope. If my mother remarried, she'd keep getting out of bed. She'd have something to live for. It also meant that there was a possibility someone would take care of her. There would be someone else who was responsible for her. I wasn't particularly concerned that the fact that whoever my mother married would be my stepfather. From what I had seen, fathers weren't too keen on being involved with the lives of their children, especially if they were girls. I found myself scanning the streets and church pews with new eyes, shopping for a husband for my mother. The problem was there were so few men in Ramsdale suitable for her. They were all too something. Too young, too old, too poor, too married. The few that had been both that were both appropriate and available met my mother's flattery and offers of home cooked meals with blank stares and flight refusals. To them, she was a woman to be avoided. They saw how hard she was willing to grip. Spring moved into summer, and once again, my hopes started to fade. Until one late morning, one late May morning, I woke up late, already covered in a thin layer of sweat. It was going to be one of those ridiculously hot Ramsdale days where the air pushed down on you and you could never get yourself to stop feeling sticky. We were in desperate need of a thunderstorm. I made a mental plan to bike down to Glass Lake and spend the entire day there. I assumed Louise would be in the kitchen. Maybe she'd pack me a lunch. But when I got downstairs, Louise wasn't in the kitchen. She was dusting the living room. She never cleaned this early in the day. Oh good, Miss Dolores, you're up. Your mother's in the kitchen and she's got something she wants to talk with you about. My heart sank. Sometimes the only thing I could imagine being worse than talking to my mother, sorry, sometimes the only thing I could imagine being worse than not talking to my mother was talking to my mother. Is she all right? Louise nodded, understanding the depth of the question I was asking. She's all right, nothing to be concerned about. This may actually be a good thing. I tried to mentally run through all the things my mother might consider to be a good thing in Louise's eyes. Maybe she was sending me away for the summer after all. My stomach clenched as I walked into the kitchen to discover my mother wearing her favorite yellow blouse, humming happily, happily away over an uh, omelet on the stove top. Good morning, Dolly. Come, have a seat. I have something to tell you. I obeyed. You know my friend, Mrs. McCoo? Her daughter, Jenny, goes to school with you. I nodded, trying to piece together what this could possibly be about. I barely knew Jenny. She had been out of school for most of the years, supposedly with polio. When she'd come back, she looked like a ghost and barely spoke to anyone. I should have been nicer to her. Is Jenny all right? Is she sick again? Yes, Lo, she's fine. Well, I don't know if fine is the right word. The McCoo house, sorry, the McCoo family house burned down. Thankfully, no one was hurt and it was mostly insured. The problem is they were supposed to have a lodger this summer, a European man by the name of Humbert Humbert. He's an academic who needs a quiet space to focus on scholarly matters. And obviously, the McCoo's house can no longer be that spot. 
You know, he even offered to teach Jenny French. Wasn't that so generous of him? I guess so. What does this have to do with us? Well, this poor man's been staying in a hotel. Isn't that just awful? I spoke with Mrs. McCoo, and she said she'd send him our way. He's coming by later today to see the place. For what? My brain still hadn't fully comprehended what was happening. Dolly, don't be dense. To see if he wants to stay with us instead. He's going to move in here? Mama, you don't even know him. I may not have met him yet, but I know he's a gentleman, and that's good enough for me. If he likes what he sees, he'll be renting out the guest bedroom for the summer. Perhaps beyond. I want to make a good impression, which is why I'm going to talk with you. Louise and I are going to tidy up this morning. I want you to pick up your I want you to pick up your things and for you to be out in the yard when he gets here. Why do I need to be in the yard? Because he's a single man. He doesn't need to be confronted with the thought of living with a child right when he gets here. I wasn't I was planning on going to the I'm so sorry. I was planning on going to the lake today. My head hurt and I was in no particular rush to meet this man who my mother was already infatuated with. I may have wanted my mother to date and find a husband, but that didn't mean I wanted a stranger in my house. You know, you will not be going to the lake. At least not until he sees the place. What? Why not? Why did, didn't you just say you wanted me out of the way? I want you out of the way, but he still needs to see you. If I tell him I have a 12-year-old daughter and he doesn't see you, he may assume the worst. What I want is for him to meet you outside while you are, while you are on your very best behavior. Sit quietly. Read something. Preferably not one of your silly little comic books. He's an academic, and I don't want him thinking I'm raising you to be stupid. You understand? Fine, I said, trying to make the word of agreement as hostile as possible. I didn't like any part of this, and I made a mental plan to scatter as many of my things around the house as possible before Humbert Humbert got here, including my silly little comic books. Okay, we're going to go into the bird's eye view one more time. A reminder from Dolores. The world has read Humbert's story exactly how he wanted it to be read, and decided who I was. A flirt taking advantage, a love-starved girl, an emotionally disturbed, promiscuous, sexually promiscuous brat, a girl unharmed by Humbert's molestation, a girl who encouraged everything that happened to her, a girl who deserved it. I've heard it all. I shouldn't have been around him in my own house. I shouldn't have let him touch me. I shouldn't have ever been in his room. These are the things that make it my fault. You could choose to listen to his version of events. After all, my story will never sell more copies than his. But if you do, I encourage you to look closer, to search for me in his words. See the moment where the veil slips. See where I'm scared. See where I hit him, where I hide from him, where I try and get away from him. Look for me, I promise you I'm in there. Not only am I scared his words will continue to be taken over mine, I'm scared of how much I want to prove that I wasn't liable. How much I need you to know that I didn't kiss him or choose to be around him. But the thing is, I very easily could have. I was emotionally vulnerable and would have done anything to feel loved and validated by an adult. Most children will, and men like Humbert know that. It doesn't mean that they deserve to be molested and abused. How much is it going to take to prove that it wasn't a 12 year old's fault? Six. Jen, thank you for sharing your beautiful words. Very impactful. I appreciate it very much. You did a great job. Um, I'm Maddie, and I'm glad all of you are here. I'm very grateful to be introducing my friend Lucas Clark today. Lucas is a Taurus, a runner, and a true lover of nature. Taurus, emphasis on first. <laughs> we spent our time together discussing religion, books we cherish, pineapple being an offensive pizza topping. Please do not attack me there for something I'm reading. <laughs> And during one of our first conversations, he told me he's thinking about becoming a wildland firefighter after earning his MFA. As much as I wasn't prepared for that response, um, I've learned that it really captures Lucas's essence and poetic interests. His poetry invites readers to move through the world as an observer, almost as if we're being directed to witness nature as its own force, one that teaches and must be preserved. Each poem is filled with incredible tenderness and empathy including grief felt for a skinned deer hanging from a basketball hoop and reflection on how gently he steps on fallen leaves. Truly, Lucas's work makes us question our own position in this existence. Despite our ideas about what it means to experience human life alongside nature, we are expected to walk through it in its many forms, loosen our expectations, and pay attention as closely as we can. Please join me in welcoming Lucas.
Uh, thank you, Maddie. That was very sweet. And Jen, really, really good start to that book. I can't wait to read the rest of it. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. So thank you all for coming. I'm really grateful to share my word to you through spoken words. And I'm grateful to be writing in Bowling Green for a couple of years. So yeah, just thank you for coming. And uh, I'll just get right into reading some poems. The first one is called Vesper. The hills swallow the sun, but now I return to the bulging pastures that expect a slowness from me. The smell of sulfur resting in dirt and a draft horse gallops to the farthest fence by the wild ride berm of a tarmac road. Over the years, how a wilderness has grown inside my chest, all those buckthorn bushes twisted together that I have spent hours untangling. Forgive me eternity for wanting the moment of that draft horse heading home tonight, drinking muddy down creek water from a farmhand's swollen palms. <clears throat> Testimony. Beneath the bramble bush growing red vines in the knots, all those raw blackberries I don't deserve. The dead crickets under grass are not delicate. The burrs, sharp against woolen socks, hear the ankle bones crackling and joints. Still, beauty is outside of me. Even the jagged maple leaves slicing one another are louder than this voice. Stillness. Walking past a harvested wheat field, I spot a gutted deer hanging from a farmer's basketball hoop. It hurts me to pay attention to the knifed open rib cage missing a heart and lungs. And down the country, there is a row of telephone poles silhouetted against a stalemate on the horizon. The pale sky and dark hills that never lapse to pitch black. Tonight, this mouth will whistle a love song to milk cows in the stables. Journey. The path beneath these feet is a dry creek bed that leads to a shriveled pond. There from the pebbles and dirt, the voice of the last cricket is honest. Though thickets of aspen surround me, I catch glimpses of the open meadow between tree trunks. Slowly the stalks of goldenrod break and sweep over, and long clouds overwhelm the sky. Witnessing is the purest form of farewell. Tonight, I can be quiet while the wind gusts bring down dead branches. Crossing. With rusted river at my throat, I hoist a cheap fishing pole and a trash bag of clothes over my head. Through water I shiver quiet enough to not offend crawdads asleep under sunken logs. Black minnows nibble on my thin ankles. I want them to remember me by words, not flesh. I wish my words sounded like raccoons brushing their teeth on needles of fallen pine branches not craving anything sweeter. Side cut. Roosting on the river are the galls that gave up fighting wind, and the flat stones I toss sideways sink sideways. The birches surrender white bark to a dried out shoreline. There are already barkless tree trunks washed up in the shallows. A limestone path through thorn bushes is comfort enough, 
and this could be the last day thistles on the banks stay purple. How I am thankful, leaning an ear in the cold river water to hear the heartbeats of trout wandering upstream. Home. An elderly nurse died alone in this house a century ago. She smoked cigarettes on the staircase, stained the carpet with ash. I assume she misses admiring amber street lights out the windows, the gatherings of gnats around glass bulbs, the minuscule buzzing of prayer on the verge of epiphany. All night I wonder if I am gentle enough to the fallen leaves I've stepped on. I scratch at scabs on my knees and knuckles, not healing. Macbeth in Ohio. Tomorrow this heart will become a meadow yellow and grass, the loose mud that dries in the dirt again hardened and humble again. And tomorrow these hands will be patient for cicadas to come and settle in palms. How oh, even the most armored skin is afraid of being brittle. And tomorrow I will speak the sound with fury. The sound will be the rainfall in the crop fields pouring into the roadside ditches and creeks. The fury will be the axed down oak trees I didn't love enough. Ohio after. I have gone where crows circle below gray clouds. Only mosquitoes miss me. In a cornfield that couldn't grow barbed wire, sown into furrows, hardens my foot soles. Here the scarecrow, whose body is stuffed with dead hornets, holds a secret within the breast pocket. A hibernating squirrel has chewed a burrow. The heart is a cornered animal. Down crows come, down, perching on my fingers, each one asking, would you like to hear my voice? Couplets. Black moles climb a hill. You're ready to see watches from a basement window. This next one's called Column of an Impossible Newspaper. A Wood County suburb was pillaged late Wednesday night by a community of chipmunks. <laughs> the newly paved streets of symmetrical ranch style houses were torn down from the rafters to floorboards, leaving behind only concrete slab foundations. According to the police report, the hundreds of rodent suspects who have scratched their five-letter trademark M-U-N-K-S monks into the doors of civilian automobiles have shaved their heads with sharp twigs and are wearing robes of dead grass. Witnesses claim seeing platoons of monks carrying timber, splinters, and potholes of wood dust to the fields of mud outside corporation limits. This act of domestic terrorism is in response to the recent deforestation of local wooded areas and has increased tension among groups of lumberjacks, carpenters, and middle-class homeowners. Despite the monk conflict being addressed via martial law, the suburban dwellers have formed hunting parties equipped with BB guns and slingshots. The hostile territory attributed to the monks on the outskirts of the city can be described as a stockpile of dismantled house lumber or a forest of downed trees. The marvel of beauty. 
There were two horses wearing bed sheets over their heads, and their pasture, which they could not see. There was a breeze that shuffled the strands of grass. There were crickets hopping and catching a ride on the breeze. There were frogs who sat below the breeze in the grass, sending their tongues into the blue sky to catch the crickets who thought they were riding the breeze. The horses searched for another in such a pasture and listened for the rustling of hooves in the wild grass. And when the horses met, they brought their snouts together and kissed like the penguins do. I wish I could fill your mouth, said one of the horses. And the other horse was silent, like a ghost. In those days, that was beauty. Uh, the rest of these poems I drafted over the past two months. Some are still going under revision, so. I'm still confident reading. I still think you're <laughs> um, Sign in the dark. Dusk on fields of snow. And I am the hound dog limping away from electric fences. The rivers have risen over concrete bridges, trapping me. The rivers are more oil than water now. I chew on bark from black walnut trees. For even me, thirst is a splinter firmly fixed in the throat. A spider web left behind in a hemlock bush. A red cardinal panicking in its nest of frost. And now, a cold air enters the tight caves of my lungs, and I give it back. Overlook. Along a ridge line of slippery rock, the thin birch saplings will stay thin. And the many days I depend on beauty are few. There's a valley below, a steel factory breathing smoke into the already gray sky. A sandstone quarry that's a deep wound brimming with blue shadow. Truth is, I've wasted all afternoon hearing only the drag of my own footsteps. My eyes passing over the imprints from crow's feet in unconserved snow. There's a slow creek that's worn down these hillsides for years, and it will outlive me. This frozen ground and these scattered pebbles will outlive me. Trespassing. I leave those sandstone ledges higher than me, following a mulched trail that switched backs into a river gorge. There a wood duck lingers on the waters of a mud basin where the bottom is darkened by heaps of dead tadpoles. A fog, barely a fog, rises from the dirt up the trunks of trees the shivering hawk moth I mistake for rigid oak bark reassures me that even a fragile life doesn't have to break. How an hour ago I cut these hands from lifting myself over a chain link fence. The moon tonight. <clears throat> Moment. I've wandered all morning only to pause before the body of a mole that froze hugging a tree root. With a handful of frosted switchgrass and a flat shard of shale, I cover that small bed. And I listen to the silence, and the silence accepts me. Above, the last sunbeams leak through oak branches. And across the sky, the lightning clouds are too far away to thunder against these hills. The way a raspberry bush turns blue in the cold, shrinking itself closer to the earth, says it all.
three unfinished poems about leaving. One. When I follow the crooked train tracks out of town, cutting my thighs on overgrown thorns all the way, the breath leaves the lungs slower and slower. There is the desire to be a hickory tree falling into a meadow of trackless barley, reducing the broad branches and leaves, reducing the body. I know I have never been more than shag bark softening the wet dirt. Two. At the limestone bridge, a hawk lets me walk near. Its feathers are mud brown like the river below, and they will stay that way till death. I do not carry a watch on my wrist anymore. I do not look at the coyote carcass in the river. All my epiphanies are internal and silent. Three. One morning, all the birds left me. I could not tell if it was the sound of wind or water. Um, this is my last one for tonight. It's called Shame. A doe is stuck in between revolving glass doors. Her hooves slipping on marble floors mopped earlier that morning. Bystanders, we sympathize with her pain. We manufacture her pain into little wooden trinkets the shape of a tongue to carry in our pockets. When I get home, I place my little wooden tongue in the empty cabinet under the sink, and the pipe water drips onto it, warps it. Thank you all for coming. I think we're doing some kind of Q&A. I have a question. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Yes. Um, Jen, your work seems to be very aware. Um, can you talk a little bit about your choices? In uh, yeah, if you could just define what you mean by aware, that would be awesome. Like, you said, like, through your, we went to that, like, bird's eye view, and it seemed to be aware of, the like, the Lord's character seems to be aware. Yeah, oh, okay, in I got the, you. In a book, and... Yeah, um, I think one of the things that I was thinking about a lot in the process of creating this, um, the first thing that kind of came to my brain is that this book exists with this massive cultural legacy. Like, it's written into countless songs, it's been made into two movies, it, like, has influenced fashion, it's taken out of context all the time. Um, and I wanted to write a book that both speaks to Dolores as a character, and I also wanted to write a book that spoke to that cultural legacy. So I wanted a way in which she could kind of see everything else that was happening. And I don't know, when I think about Dolores Hayes, like obviously she is this fictional character, but to me she's become a very real person in a lot of ways, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the story exists in so many other forms across the world and uh, in the lives of other women and other survivors. So I kind of wanted this like witness who was aware of that cultural legacy and also kind of in some ways embodies, of, embodies those other stories. I think there's a person in the pink hat. Yeah, uh, public domain was a big question that I had. It's not published. I hope it will get published someday. Um, you know, everybody has dreams. Um, but um, the public domain question, it is technically in the public domain. And one of the reasons I really, really wanted to, to write this book, I mean, I personally didn't want to write it, but I wanted it to be written, is that there is one rewriting of Dolores Hayes' story, but it's 
um, called Lowe's Diary, and it writes her as a demonic seductress who ruined the life of a good man. And the fact that that book exists makes me angry in a lot of ways. And the fact that the only way that we've managed to speak to the story of this survivor is through this lens of demonizing was unacceptable to me. And I kind of was in the mental space of, oh, it can't be me who writes it. I'm just like one tiny little rat-sized person who's trying to do stuff. Um, but I think a lot of people think that way, and if nobody does it, then we're just going to continue in this world where she doesn't get to talk, and to me, I don't want to live there. <laughs> yeah, I have questions for reason. So why are you finishing like the I feel like you stay confident? Um, <laughs> um, no, um, I'm definitely wondering what your coaching process is. What your coaching process is actually like, like what really like it's happened to you, or like how have you grown from it? Yeah, so um, all the poems I've written while I've been to BG, we're not talking about the high school <laughs> All the poems I've written since I've been to BG, I um, I walk out in the woods or in the countryside and I write down what I see. Um, in my mind, but also out in the countryside, and that's where they all come from. Um, Obviously now I'm kind of just sitting at a desk looking at all my you know books of notes that I took when I was born right now because I'm not walking outside right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's I'm mostly walking outside, getting outside, moving around. I have a Lucas question as well. You write with such tenderness and clear love for the natural spaces of the world. And I'm curious, like, if there are any specific, maybe formative childhood experiences that kind of key you into that space and make you want to, like, preserve these spaces in your poems? Hmm, childhood experiences. Well, I did grow up in a small, one traffic light town surrounded by crop fields. Um, we had a park, my parents are here. We had a park in our backyard with a woods in it that they would kind of just let us run in all the time. So yeah, I, I did grow up around a lot of nature, I think. And, but yeah, I mean, I just, I think that once you step in the woods, once you're out there and it's quiet and it's just you and your notes, like that's, I mean, that's what comes out. It's beautiful feelings towards it, so. <laughs> I 